Hi, I'm Lise Wheel here at Long Crime in the in the Stanley Liggins case. I'm here with Yasha Gunasakara. Yasha, it's so great to have you here in the next couple hours with me. Thank you so much for being here. Um, tough case. Now we're here. Uh, Liggins is being tried for the third time. Uh, this is a case that is 28 years old, and of course you know the facts of this case. We got this, you know, this poor nine-year-old girl who was brutally murdered. That that we know. She was brutally murdered. Um, and and now this man is now being tried for the third time. Uh, we've got the criminologist on the stand, and this cross examination, critically going through what he didn't do, what he didn't test for, you know, and it, and it's kind of classic cross examination where you're just you know trying to get out these yes no answers, yes no answers, yes no answers, and he's going no I didn't do this, no I didn't do that. What do you take away from that? What, what is your sense of this in, in going through this cross-examination? I think it's incredibly powerful, and I think it's really what the defense has on their side here. They're going to be trying to poke holes in each and every testimony that they see, and so far they've done a very effective job. Now, can the prosecution prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt? And that's what they're trying to get at. They absolutely can't. Right. Oh, they can't. So you're coming out right now and saying they can't do it. Well, I think so far what I've seen, I think the defense has on their side time. As you said, right. this case is so old. And so a lot of the evidence is either not there. And if the, if the investigation wasn't done properly at that time, it's now too late to go back and try to redo it. It's too late to try to fix, fix those mistakes. So there's a lot happening here, but obviously right. the prosecution still feels like they can prove their case. Well, what they have are uh, forensics. Now, they still have the forensics, right? Because even though a case is 28 years old, they still have the forensics. They're able to, you know, the forensics still speak from the grave, if you will. They've got things like the way that she was, you know, ta attached uh, in the, gar the garbage bag and how that was, you know, set on fire and the gas tank and all of that. So they have those forensics that do speak from the tank, from the, from the grave. What about that? You know, those don't go away. Well, the question is, can they, it, does the forensics connect Stanley Liggins exactly. to the murder. So right. obviously we know that she was murdered. Something horrible, horribly yes. happened to her. But Do the question connect? is, I don't think that they connect. Okay. All right. So you're, okay, that's your, it's going to be fascinating uh, over the next couple of hours to see whether or not, and we, Josh is coming out pretty strong here and saying that they don't connect, whether or not this criminologist, uh, in, in, now in this cross-examination, uh, he's kind of at the latter part of his, of his examination, what the prosecution has next. Do they have enough to bring past cross-examination to cross-examine uh, Mr. Liggins uh, to this point? We'll be back. All right, the judge is asking if the jurors want to just kind of stand and stretch. The, the, the uh, cross-examination has gone on for quite a while here. Really what they're asking uh, the cross-examination is sort of what, what, uh, what, what the criminalist did or did not do, what he hadn't done, uh, kind of where the, the uh, things he had moved uh, where he'd move them to. It's sort of classic cross-examination, kind of trying to muddy the waters. Um, right, Yosha? I mean, this is really what a good defense lawyer does. Exactly. They're really trying to capitalize on all the holes, all the things yes. that he didn't do. And he's trying to explain away certain things by saying the technology right. wasn't as good. Right. Um, but again, there's basic keys in doing a proper investigation and that's what they're capitalizing on you didn't do the basic things it doesn't matter that technology has changed there are certain things that you must do in an investigation this serious right. that he simply didn't do right 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 and they they are making we we don't know because we're not in the in the minds of the jury but we're sitting here analyzing this and just looking through sort of a, a you know a minute by minute transcript of what he's saying because we're looking getting this here a long crime and no I didn't do this no I didn't do that or oh, I didn't think of that or I didn't move that or well, why didn't you do this I mean it's kind of cringeworthy it's not great but the prosecution's gonna say of look course. those were not right. important to the investigation they didn't need to be done 
Stanley Liggins was such an obvious um, right. person, and, and they didn't need to do all of that extra right, stuff. Right, exactly. Now, we just learned that the, a jury is going to take a 10-minute break, um, which doesn't surprise me at all because this has gone on for a long time, and the jury needs to kind of stretch their minds a little bit, and uh, as, as we all do. Um, but I think that's, what, that's right. The prosecution is going to come back and almost switch it around a little bit and say, really, sort of, into the mind of the jury, Defense, that's all you got, is to be able to poke holes in something like this where um, they didn't do that because Ligon's was so obviously the choice. They didn't need to do any of the other. They didn't. It's like, why would you even look for something else when Ligon's was so obviously the one? Exactly. But I, I think the jurors are going to call that bluff because there really isn't mm -hmm. a lot of evidence out there right now. Again, it's very circumstantial. And as you mentioned, most of these type of cases are circumstantial. Very few times do we get someone caught red handed or an eyewitness. But even the circumstantial evidence that they have just isn't enough, in my opinion, to, to prove this case to the highest legal standard, uh, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. Exactly. So we'll have to see what they have next, though, because this is not their last witness. Um, so what else they have in store? But I don't think they're going to end with this. I mean, they're going to have something more that they've got. Uh, but I hope that it's going to be more than testimony written, uh, read off, because as you said, that reading of the testimony, even though it was sometimes, uh, you know, eye eyewitnesses, not eyewitnesses to the crime, but neighbors, for example, kind of dull. And that's part of the problem. Yes, it's tough, and you, and you start to worry about the jurors um, and, and right. whether they can pay attention and maintain attention to this very important case. Speaking of paying attention, let's go pay attention to today's top crimes. Hi, I'm Lise Wheel. I'm here with Yosha Gunasekera. Did I pronounce that correctly? Oh, I'm so glad. Um, and we're here on the Stanley Liggins case. Of course, you know that this is now his third trial for a, a rape and murder of a nine-year-old, little nine-year-old Jennifer back in 1990. A horrible, horrible case. Um, we were talking, Yosha, about why the prosecutors would try him again after two times. They did get convictions both times, but both times those convictions were overturned. One time because they didn't, and I come from a prosecutor stand, viewpoint here, I was a federal prosecutor, one time because they didn't turn over police reports. The second time because they didn't reveal that somebody they put it on the stand had been a paid police informant. So, you know, people will say, oh, well, you know, technicalities, it got off on technicalities. Those are pretty darn important, quote unquote, technicalities. We don't want that in our prosecutors doing that, do we? No, they are huge, egregious errors. And in the police reports, it was found that there could be potentially exculpatory Absolutely. information. And so it's just really damaging because Wrong. you want to pursue justice in the right way. That's you right. want to turn over what you're supposed to turn over, reveal what you're supposed to reveal. And that just wasn't done here, which then begs the question, why, why did they decide to go forward on this case, especially to the point that you made earlier? He's been in for 28 years. Generally, you would think in this type of case, a prosecutor would say, just plead guilty. We'll say time served for the 28 years that you did, and we'll move on because these trials take a lot of money, a lot of resources, and a lot of time. But I guess it's clear to the prosecution that they feel like they can prove their case, and they feel that they have a strong enough case to secure um, a conviction. Another, another conviction and get more time, get him to, to spend the rest of his life in prison, which is obviously what they want. Because 28 years for murder is, 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 is not life, but it's still a long time. It's, it's as long as many people would get for murder. So he's, they didn't maybe offer it to him or he didn't take it. Maybe he's maintaining his innocence through all of this. I mean, that could be, that could be it as well. Um, but it just seems, I mean, there's just a big question to me of why are they pursuing us and they too awful, awful, uh, you know, you read, read the appeals. I mean, it's just, I don't understand it. I mean, I, I really don't understand how you can just not turn over. I mean, one report, two reports, oh, they got, they went missing or they got the wrong file or something. 
dozens, 70 plus, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's definitely very unfair to the defense. That's why it was overturned. And I would imagine, though, if Mr. Lingens was offered a time served, that he probably would take it just for oh, fear yeah. of losing the case. So I can't imagine that was even offered. And again, you're, I'm looking at the evidence that they're going to try to present. Unless there's some smoking gun, I still don't see it. I mean, Mr. Liggins did have, uh, you know, a previous charge kind of right. similar to this nature. So that's definitely something that the prosecution can pull out. But again, it just so many years later, the jury knows that he was tried right. and then obviously can assume that he was overturned because here they are again. They're not allowed to know what he was they sentenced to. But they I don't think know. that that kind of in some ways taints the jury, too, because mm. they know that this has been tried twice and the prosecution just couldn't make a conviction. Right. Stick. Well, we know there's been a change of venue. It's a fascinating case, though. All right. Now, sometimes. Uh, OK. Um, Looks like, we're watching the courtroom for you, looks like the jury is coming back in. Uh, you can see it there. We're looking at, look, the jury is coming in. So once we get a witness on the stand, we will definitely go to that. Everybody's standing up right now, so that must mean the jury is coming in, uh, putting a new witness on the stand. Be fascinating, won't it, Yosha, to see who, who they put on the stand uh, now, um, whether we go back to the cross-examination of the criminalist, um, everybody's sitting down. Okay, so let's see whether or not uh, we'll actually have. It looks like we're going back to court right now. All right, so let's go back live to the Stanley Ligon's case. Looks like we're resuming cross examination. Here we go. Yosha, again, they're fi finalizing or finishing the cross examination, sort of with classic t techniques about. What he didn't do, I mean, he's doing the analysis of what finding uh, under her under her skin, under her fingernails, but again, what he didn't do, right? The DNA, uh, but it's talking about well, what it wasn't available then, the testing wasn't available then, but still, what he didn't do, right? Exactly, and I think it was a very effective cross by the defense because, again, sure, technology has changed, right. but there are basic standards that he has to hold himself to that he didn't do, which is all the more reason why it's surprising that the prosecution decided to move forward on this case, because it's weaknesses like this that really poke holes in their overall case. That is, in my opinion, already fairly weak. Well, and this is, he's a critical witness for them. I mean, this is the criminalist. I mean, this is, he, you know, he's, he's talking about the skin, scratches, scratches. I mean, this is like, this is really critical stuff. And if he looks bad, as he kind of did here, with all the things that he didn't do, and we're not talking about, you know, 50 years ago, we're talking about 28 years ago, not, you know, there were certain standards that even, and as you say, even those days, he didn't, he didn't appeal to those standards. He looks bad. Exactly. This is the type of case where forensic evidence is going to be so Critical. important Critical. because the circumstantial evidence isn't very good. The circumstantial evidence is that he saw her. There was right. a car that looked like his. And don't, and don't forget, much of the circumstantial evidence is being read in by transcripts. Exactly. So it's not even live, sort of exciting, if you will, circumstantial evidence. It, that's exactly right. And that's why the live um, testimony is so important, because this is what's going to grab the jurors' attention. As much as they're going to try to pay attention, listening to someone read something off a piece of paper just, isn't exactly riveting. Right. Well, and the voices are different. You know, you're talking about, you know, somebody is 70 years old and they're, you know, it's being read by a 35-year-old. I mean, I'm sorry. It's just a little bit jarring when you're, you're supposed to sort of follow through, but it's just, it's a little bit jarring. So this guy not getting it? I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's tough. It's going to be tough for the prosecution, but we'll have to wait and see what else they have. Yeah. Um, okay, exactly that. I mean, Yoshi has got it exactly right. That we've got to wait to see what, whatever the, what else the prosecution has. Um, and we will do that at the other side of this break. So hang with us. We'll be back in the Liggins case on the other side of this break. All right, now we have the second criminalist on the stand. Sabrina Seehofer is the second criminalist on the stand. Um, she was assigned to the case, 
And her preliminary, what you'll show us, we're going to hear preliminarily what she's talking about, it really is about the change in what they were doing back in the early 1990s, basically different how they were testing or not testing DNA, right? Um, it sounds a little bit, even though she's for the prosecution, to my ear, defensive. Am I getting that incorrectly? I think she's again on the defensive because she's trying to explain why testing wasn't done, you know, those 28 years ago. Right. And so she's trying to say, you know, science has changed. Now I think she was starting to say you need a lot, a smaller sample to be able to test. You don't have to have as big of a sample as you do. Nowadays, yeah, right, yeah. right, right, right. So I, so I think she is a little bit on the defensive because there... Even though she's for the prosecution. Yeah, right. well, I, I think she's defensive to, to the questions because right. she's trying to explain um, exactly what's going on and, and how things have changed. Um, and it's going to be interesting to hear her perspective. You know, to, no, now, to be fair, we've, I've, we've been a little harsh. <laughs> to be fair, um, I think there is this, since the 1990s, since, since 28 years ago, this sort of CSI effect that has happened, right, where we sort of expect almost in a shoplifting case that we're going to, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little facetious here, expect to have, you know, um, blood spatter experts. Where we, that's ridiculous. We're not going to have that in a shoplifting case. Because things that science has progressed so much, or our, our understanding of science has progressed so much since the 1990s, mm -hmm. early 1990s. So, you know, to be fair, she's trying to explain something and looking a little defensive, but we were, we have progressed so far since 1990, mm -hmm. when this, or early 1990s when this happened. Exactly. I just, this is a murder case. A man is facing right. life in prison. I would expect more than the weak circumstantial evidence that they're offering up because it's not a shoplifting case. It's a very not. serious case and they have to admit their weaknesses. And if their case is too weak to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, even if they probably think he did it, they can't prosecute him. And so that's where I think the big issue is here. And that's the bone I have to pick with what the prosecution is doing. Well, and, what, and you hit it right on the head, which is that their their hard witness their hard evidence is forensic evidence so if they're soft on this hard evidence that's problematic because they don't have the eyewitness they never did back then and they certainly don't now they never had that eyewitness all right all right so we'll be back more with the stanley ligands case on the other side of this break stay with us I'm very fortunate in this hour to have with me Yosha Gunasekera for this hour again. So thank you so much for being sticking with me here because uh, this is tough stuff. But we have this criminalist who is also a DNA expert and she's going through uh, and really very thoroughly, I think, uh, in this in this direct. We had the last hour we had the cross examination uh, of the first criminalist. Um, but going through the the what she did in her DNA analysis and and she's very she's very well qualified was qualified back in back in the day and still is um going through what she did then with her known samples and her and her what she had at the, at the time um but many of her of her exams come through with consistent with conclusive interpret inconclusive interpretations uh partial profiles you know these are not really the most uh, solid examples that you want if you're the prosecution, right? Exactly. It's very vague language. And I'm not a DNA expert, but it sounds a little concerning that these are partial profiles. Right. And the defense is going to put on their own DNA expert Correct. to undercut some of the things that she is saying. Right, right. I'm not a DNA expert either, but you're just listening to this and, and hearing, putting on my jury ears, um, these are not necessarily the strongest, the strongest things you want. And now this is the second criminalist that they have on the stand. So again, uh, we're hearing this is just a direct examination. Defendant has not even, defense has not had a chance to cross-examine uh, this defendant. We still are on direct and we will be coming back to more direct examination after this break. Uh, so stick with us. This is a fascinating case. Again, this is the second, third time that uh, Mr. Liggins has been tried for this brutal murder. Uh, this little Jennifer will be right back after this break. This gets curiouser and curiouser. Professor Zarnetsky, all right, he is a professor of meteorology. 
Now, Yosha, why would they have a prof this is the, pr the uh, prosecution here, a professor of meteorology? Degradation of the body, the way the DNA. Does it's, this strike you as a little bit desperate possible. for the prosecution? It's very odd to me. I mean, we're trying to figure out the weather in 1990, to, right. and a meteorologist can't even accurately tell me the weather for today. We were talking about looking at our phones now, and it's supposed to be raining out in New York, and you look at the phone, and it tells you it's, and it's off for today. It, exactly. It seems very strange, because they're looking at charts that predicted the weather, but obviously that's not necessarily accurate, as we all know. And right. I, this is something that jurors know, too. The weather, it's very difficult to predict the weather, so it's interesting interesting that they brought the meteorologist in. Again, it's not even clear yet for what reason that may be. He's a professor of meteorology, so that's your, you know, certainly credentials and all of that. Um, my first thinking, especially after we came off a fairly weak, I thought the, I thought the DNA expert was stronger than the criminalist um, as far as the two expert witnesses that we just had, but then to bring a meteorologist on where we're all kind of, I mean, if you and I are sort of scratching our heads, and I bet some of our viewers are as well, then, you know, we're sort of the, the other jurors out here. Um, we're not in panel, but if we're all having that reaction, then, you know, what reaction are they having? Why bring a meteorologist in? The degradation of the DNA? DNA is DNA. You know, so kind of it seems like a little bit of a stretch to me but hang on we'll be back after this break for more in the Stanley Ligon's case hang with us right back all right on the stand we have a former Davenport police officer Rich Lundbaum so Yasha this is just shows one of the um, intricacies and difficulties actually of trying a case this this old because this Davenport police officer, former for Davenport police officer, has to go into his report and read from it about a neighbor, somebody who was, he was canvassing the area where Jennifer used to live, and look in that report and have this talk about what a woman reading from this report, what she saw. And she saw burning, uh, something burning, and a man running from it, and she describes that man. Yes, and the description sounds very vague. It's and and we're hearing the prosecutor almost try to get out more right. and and saying, "Is there anything, anything else?" else? <laughs> and then he said, "No." And he said, "Well, was there anything about the tennis, tennis shoes?" Right. Which I'm actually surprised that the defense attorneys aren't it's objecting very to. Right. Not only because it's leading, but because it's been asked and answered. He said there was nothing else. That's the end of the story. You can't prompt your witnesses into it's saying something. It's all in something. the report. Exactly, and the prosecution just like the defense, has time to speak and prepare their witnesses accordingly. So this shouldn't be happening in cases like this, especially with such important pieces of circumstantial evidence. Because right. if you don't have the forensics, which again is still debatable at this stage, the, str the strength of the forensics, but really the eyewitness or as close to eyewitness accounts as you can get are so important. So you would think this would be a little better prepared. Right. This is an important witness, even though she, he's reading from, you know, her, her words from this report but she but it is a description and the description is some what you can't say it's a match because it is so vague but the vagaries do match ligands um, you know anybody can wear the tennis shoe but but um, the rest of it does match him and the body the the burning is you could certainly make the inference is poor little Jennifer's body. So that's pretty that's pretty good evidence, at least that's circumstantial evidence. And of course we know circumstantial evidence is building these brick upon brick upon brick when you don't have the direct evidence of somebody actually seeing uh, you know murder, which is very, very rare to have anyway. All right, so very interesting. Uh, thank you for your analysis. Hang with us. We'll be right back on the other side of this break. Stanny Liggins. Okay, so we had to, they're doing a little bit of sidebarring, talking about refreshing recollection of this witness. Uh, the, on cross-examination, the defense lawyer said, would it help you refresh your recollection looking at a report? Uh, the prosecution asked for a moment uh, with the judge. So that's what's going on right now out of our view. They're kind of talking with the judge and, and going over that report. It's really hard, Yelsha, when you've got so many reports, you're talking about reports that are so old, 
Um, so many pretrial motions must have happened before this even got started. I shudder to think about it. There were many, many, many pretrial motions, but things like this will happen when you've got somebody on the stand, even though you've gone over it, I'm sure, so many times before, you will have something like this come up where a, a witness on the stand says, I don't recall, which is what he has said many, many times. He said, I don't remember, I don't remember. And then the other side says, would it help you to re refresh your recollection? And boom, then you need to have a, a sidebar. And that's what's going on now where they need to talk about what happens next. Uh, and that's why you're having this moment. So um, not surprising. It may take a little bit for them to hash that out. And while well, we'll be watching to see what happens, what are you thinking so far about really the, the effect of this cross-examination? First of all, the, the effect of his direct was really to be able to read um, what Roberta had said about seeing Jennifer. That was really the thing. That was really the reason he was on. I, I think this was very powerful because he is not able to remember everything. And I think that that in itself is very telling to a juror, jurors because they're seeing how old this case is. They're seeing how much evidence is lost, how memories have eroded. And frankly, that may be counted against the, the prosecution. And, and, and maybe that is fair. I mean, they've had many bites at the apple. They haven't been able to get a conviction. And so this loss of memory should be concerning to the jurors. That's right, exactly. I mean, they, it, it's, it's not really so much a loss of memory because he is looking at, you know, the report and he's going from the report. But he's saying, you know, this from, I can't tell you what's not on this report. Um, I have got to say, this has been such a delightful two hours with you here, Yosha. You have gone through, we've gone, you know, we've had some interesting witnesses. We had a professor of meteorology. Now, I think both of us were kind of like, you know, why is this professor of meteorology on the stand? Do you, I mean, we're still not sure exactly why, because as we were telling each other, we're not sure we can tell the weather from, you know, one hour to the next. And we've got great meteorologists here in New York. They're not sure they can tell the weather, but you've just been so great. And it's Yasha Guna Sakara. Yes. So yeah. I got it right. Okay. You have just been so great analyzing these, uh, these witnesses for the last two hours. I just so appreciate your being here with us in Law and Crime. Um, this is a tough case. And you came out right from the beginning saying, Prosecution hasn't made it. What do you think you're at the end of these two hours? It's tough. I think it's really going to come down to the forensic evidence again. And I, I'm just very surprised at the brevity of, of the cross-examination and the direct uh, on these cases. Because I've seen many cases where you do have a DNA expert and they testify for hours, if not days. So I think that that's very important here. And I think part of the reason of the brevity of the testimony is that there's just not enough DNA samples to test. This is a very old case, so it'll be interesting to see what witnesses the defense puts on. Yeah, as we were saying that the prosecution's case is fascinating, and obviously they carry the burden, as in every criminal case. Uh, but we're kind of waiting to see what is the defense going to do here? Because they've been poking a lot of holes, um, but now when the prosecution looks to us so that it's sort of winding up, what will the defense be putting on? Uh, they've had two times where they've had these convictions overturned, but now they have a new defense, uh, a new, you know, will they put the defendant on the stand this time? Who knows? It's going to be very interesting. So follow us in Law and Crime as we continue to follow the Stanley Liggins case. I'm Lise Wheel signing off for the day. See you next time for Law and Crime.